here's an example. We have a parallel RLC circuit and we see that our voltage source is in the steady state, so a steady state solution using phasers is appropriate. Now, what are we asked to find? Well, there are three parts. Part A, we're asked to find the total current supplied by the source and then to draw the current vector diagram. These vector diagrams in this sort of a problem are essential in understanding the problem, and so uh, we will lean heavily on that during the solution and interpreting the solution. And then part B, we're asked to find the total impedance seen by the voltage source, and then finally find the true, apparent, and reactive power delivered by the source, and then we'll draw the power triangle. So to get started with the first part, we will determine what information we are given, and we see that we are given a value for the voltage in polar form of 60 volts at zero degrees. We'll write that in rectangular form as 60 plus J0 volts. And then also we are given the value of the resistor, 10 to the third ohms, one kilo ohm. And the capacitor is 22 times 10 to the minus nine farads. And we'll write the five millihenry inductor as five times 10 to the minus third henrys. Now also we need to be given information about the voltage source frequency and we're told that that's 10 to the fourth hertz, so we'll write that out. That's 10 kilohertz. Now for this part we are asked to find the total current supplied by the source and that's I phaser. Now what do we know? In other words, what is the relationship between the given information and the unknown that we're asked to solve for? Well, we know in general the relationship in parallel circuits is that the voltage across each branch is the same. So the voltage across the resistor is equal to the voltage across the inductor, which is also equal to the voltage across the capacitor, and that's all equal to the applied voltage. We also know that Kirchhoff's current law applies in every circuit, and so we might be able to use that in this case as well. So now we can proceed with the solution. Eventually, we're going to need the reactances of the reactive components. And so let's begin by calculating the inductive and capacitive reactances. And I'll begin with the inductive reactance. And we know that that's equal to 2 times pi times the frequency, which was 10 to the fourth hertz, times the inductance value, which was 5 times 10 to the minus third henrys. Now, 2 times 5 is 10, and then 10 times 10 to the fourth is 10 to the fifth and times 10 to the negative third is 10 squared, so we end up with 100 pi, or approximately 314.2, and that will be in ohms. Similarly, for the capacitive reactants, we have the reciprocal of 2 times pi times the frequency, 10 to the fourth times the capacitance, 22 nanofarads, to the negative one, that's the reciprocal, and on my calculator I have solved that and I got 723.4 ohms. Now the negative sign is here, I'm anticipating the fact that we know that the imaginary part of the reactance of a capacitor is negative j times the reactance, and the negative sign is already here, uh, but the reactance itself is 723.4 ohms. Next, we can calculate the branch currents using the reactances that we calculated above here. And let's begin with the current through the resistor, which will just simply be the applied voltage across the resistor uh, divided by the resistance itself. And we're going to use Ohm's law in phasor form. So the voltage will be 60 plus J0 volts, and that will be divided by one kilo ohm or 1000 plus J0 in phasor form and we'll get 60 plus J0, that will be in milliamps. Or in polar form, we would write 60 at an angle zero degrees, and that's also in milliamps. Next, we'll find the current through the capacitor, again in phasor form, and that will be the phasor voltage divided by the capacitive reactance, which we found to be 60 plus J0 over zero minus J, 723.4, and on our calculator solving, I get about 82.9 at an angle of 90 degrees, and that's going to be in milliamps. Now we got a positive angle here of 90 degrees, and that makes sense because we know that for a capacitor, current leads voltage by 90 degrees, 
and we are using for our reference vector the voltage across each branch because that's what's the same in a parallel circuit. We can make the same calculation to find the current through the inductor in phasor form again, and this will be the voltage across the inductor divided by the inductive reactance, and that's going to be 60 plus J0 divided by 0 plus J314.2. And I get a magnitude of 191, that will be in milliamps, at an angle of negative 90 degrees. And this up here was in milliamps as well. Now, the negative sign again makes sense because for the inductor, remember that current is lagging voltage, and voltage is our reference vector being the same across all the branches. So the negative sign makes sense. Now that we've got all the branch currents, we can apply Kirchhoff's current law in phasor form, of course, and we can write that the current that we're looking for is equal to the current through the resistor plus the current through the capacitor plus the current through the inductor, all in phasor form. And those are all available up here. So I'll just add those together. Um, if you use a different calculator, make sure that you do it in such a way that you're maintaining the internal resolution of your calculator, as I'm demonstrating here. I add these together, and I see I need... So I add these together. I need to first enter the uh, resistor phasor first, resistor current phasor, and then I add them together, and I get 123.6 milliamps at an angle of negative 60.96 degrees. And that's what we were asked to find in part A, although we still have to draw the vector diagram so that we can interpret this result. So to begin with, we draw the voltage vector on the horizontal axis because we know that's the same across all the branches, so that will be our reference vector for this parallel example. And then I know also that the current through the resistor is in phase with the voltage across it, so that gets also drawn on the same axis as the voltage vector. Then up here on the positive vertical axis, I will draw the capacitive current because I know that for the capacitor, current is leading the voltage, so that is drawn here. And then down below in the negative direction, I will draw the current through the inductor because we know that for the inductor the current is lagging the voltage. Now I've made no attempt to draw these vectors to scale. I can see here uh, by comparing the magnitudes of these two current components that the inductive current is going to dominate the reactive current because it's much larger than the magnitude of the capacitive current and they are 180 degrees out of phase so a portion of the capacitive current will cancel the dominant inductive current and we can see that on our vector diagram so I'm going to redraw that vector diagram uh, I will put the uh, resistive current on the horizontal axis as before and then down here will be the difference between the magnitudes of the inductive and capacitive currents and then the total current supplied by the source will be here along the long diagonal and moving the vector from the left, repeating it to the right here, that's I sub L minus I sub C. And now the values, um, and I see that I have my calculated current is given in polar form. If I put that in rectangular form, I can then see the various values for the um, total reactive current and the resistive current. So the reactive current is negative 108 milliamps and the resistive current is 60 milliamps. And the total current we have as 123.6 milliamps from our result above. And the angle here in our diagram is minus 61 degrees approximately.